Lord, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you are doing in our lives. Lord, you have been changing us. You've been remolding us. You've been doing all of these things because you care about us. You have patience with us. We oftentimes neglect you. We oftentimes reject you. But Lord, you constantly pursue us and you constantly want to be more intimate with us. So Lord, we we ask you right now in Jesus' name that you can speak to our lives, to every individual here. Speak to us as we read your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, for those of you guys who know me personally, you guys know that I, I like posting videos on, Facebook or on YouTube, okay? And that's kind of like my hobby. That's kind of what I love doing. I love making people laugh. That's just who I am. I've been doing it since I was very young, uh, just working on film. Video is like my passion. It's a gift that God has given me, and I always want to use it for his glory. And, and, I've, um, and I do vlogging. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's basically when you share your life and you show people what you're doing and what you're up to and you post it on YouTube for people to see. And, and, and I've been doing that even before vlogging was popular. You know, um, I go to vacations and I bring a camera and I turn it around like, hey, we're at, you know, Disney and this is what we're doing. And, you know, I just show it to my family. But then I realized that people actually do this on YouTube and, and people actually watch this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? There's a lot of horrible things on, on TV, like reality TV shows. And, you know, like, okay, I'm going to start doing this. I'm just going to start, you know, filming me and, and just showing what I do in my life. And, and God has been using that in such a tremendous way. He's been opening doors that I couldn't even imagine. At first, it just started out as something just like a hobby because I love doing it. But then now people are actually responding to it and saying, wow, you're giving me hope. You're, you're showing me that, you know, living a Christian life isn't what I thought it was. You know, wow, you're a pastor. How can you be a pastor? You're, you're so different. And, and I just see that God is using um, this gift that he's given to me to glorify him. And one of the things I do is, um, I, I try to do it every Friday, but when I don't have time, I don't, but um, I, I do this video, it's called Friday Let's Be Real, which, you know, I just sit in front of a camera and I just become real with people. And I do that here with you guys, but sometimes people on, you know, social media, they don't, they don't come to church. So I try to use that avenue to reach people who are lost, reach people who don't know the gospel. And so um, who in here actually watched uh, my latest one? It's called Why Facebook is Killing Us, okay? <laughs> if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to watch it because um, God has been just speaking to me loudly. And I'm, guys, I'm telling you loudly, so loud that, that it's kind of like, I can't not say this, okay? Because like he's been speaking to me first. So what I'm going to tell you guys are things that I've been convicted of, okay, with social media, with Facebook, so the sermon for today, that's what it's called. It's called, Why Facebook is Killing Us, okay? Everyone say, Facebook is Killing Us. Facebook is killing all right, I know you mean it, all right? Maybe you, you I don't want to say it because I love Facebook. Maybe you, you just love Facebook, okay? I don't know where you are. But guys, Facebook, and not only Facebook, it's every other social media thing. It is killing us, guys. It is, it is completely changing the way we socialize Okay, and I'm going to read to you some examples of, of statuses. This is not any one specific that I got. This is just a website that I saw, like, most famous, dramatic statuses. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you've been posting things like this. I don't know. But, but here it is. Uh, one of, you know, what status, for example, says, Drama, no thanks. Don't like me, your problem. Love me or hate me, please. I'm still going to shine. <laughs> All right? It's just, you know, like, ah, you know, I don't care. All right? Another one is, uh, if he already ruined your mascara, don't let him ruin your life, okay? All right, people just post those little things. Another one is, um, hmm, excuse me, I think that your drama belongs back in the kindergarten aisle, which is right next to the immature aisle, so go take it back to the who cares store. We, re we read that, right, on Facebook. We're like, oh, we like it, right? Sometimes we comment, preach it, you know? Another one, um, love your haters because they make you strong. Think positive, smile, and let others smile. Life will be so great. Okay, really, guys, we are addicted to social media. Uh, I mean, we, we really are. And, and 
I mean, if you don't use Facebook, <laughs> God bless your soul. Don't make a Facebook profile, please, okay? But, but for us who do actually use Facebook, um, it, it really has consumed our life. Our phones have become like a secondary organ that, you know, it seems like when we don't have our phones, sometimes we feel something vibrate and we're like, oh, is that my phone? Like, no, that's your head, man. Nothing is vibrating in your pocket. All right, it's like, like you know, like as soon as the phone rings or as soon as the phone vibrates, we can be in mid-conversation with someone, all of a sudden, oh, you know, and, and we're just on our phones because we feel the need to listen to what people have to say. We want to know their opinions. We want to know if they liked our status. We want to know what others think about our life. And social media has been doing that. Almost to the point where um, it marvels us. We go on Facebook for entertainment sometimes. I mean, sometimes we're completely bored. We have nothing to do. We're finished with our homework. We're finished with work. The kids are in bed. We're just laying down or maybe we're just seated down and we're bored. What, what am I going to do? You just go on your phone for no reason, and you're just flipping around. All of a sudden, you see a little notification on Facebook. You have two unread notifications, and your finger naturally goes on that icon because you feel, well, I have nothing else better to do, so I'm going to see what people have to say. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, many times, I find myself without even, because you know when you're driving, and like you're just going to that place, you don't even like you don't even think, you just automatically go. Like every Sunday, I automatically go to Jimmy's house, pick him up, come here, and it's just I don't have to think, right? In the same way, sometimes I find myself on Facebook, just scrolling around through the news feeds, just looking at people's pictures, looking, just reading for like half an hour, and I'm like, what am I doing? Until like I realize, like I'm on Facebook for half an hour. What is going on? You know, it just sucks us in. Facebook has that power. And many of us, if we are not held accountable, if no one is kind of waking us up, we spend, we can spend all day on Facebook, right? We're in a line, right? We're, we're, we're getting ready to get gas or maybe, you know, pumping gas and we're just, what, Facebook, right? We're, we're in a line to, you know, get McDonald's or like, like in a restaurant, you know, we have all our friends there, our family, and, and while we're waiting for our food, instead of talking to each other, hey, how are you going? We're, oh, look what Facebook is doing. Oh, look, look, look at this person. And, and, and we're just consumed, and it's like a world inside of a world, and we've lost the knowledge of, of how to communicate. Many people, they can show up on Facebook and they can say all of these things, man. They can have conversations with you and they can put others down and they can lift people up and they can respond. They can have every opinion about everything there is on Facebook. But then when you see them face to face, they are quiet. They don't know how to speak. They're too afraid and they're not that macho man that they seem like they are on Facebook. But really, that comes with any social media. It really is anything that we are consumed with. It can be a TV show. It can be a Twitter. It can be Pinterest. It can be any kind of thing that just consumes our life that brings us away from other people. But that's not the point. The point of the sermon is not about Facebook. It's about the things that we marvel about. Because we want to search something that marvels us, that amazes us. So we go to Facebook seeking something that just wants to feed us, right? Like, I wanna, I wanna be entertained, I wanna watch this movie, I wanna um, just watch this TV show to be entertained. My life is boring, so I'm gonna see what other people are doing. Oh, look, this person's in vacation. Oh, I wish I was in vacation. Oh, look at this TV show, it's so awesome. I wanna watch it too. But in Matthew 8, there's a story that really hit home for me. It really hit home for me. In Matthew 8, I'm going to read the whole thing just so we can get a bigger context and then I'm going to piece it together. Matthew 8, verse 18. 8, verse 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And the scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. 
And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? I want to focus on the word marveled. See, when I read that, I was thinking, what, what are they marveling about? How, what does it mean to marvel? They looked at Jesus and they were marveled. Maybe your, uh, your uh, version says amazed, okay? Marveled, amazed, astonished, surprised. What does it mean to be marveled? Because we are so marveled by everything else in the world. We're so marveled by the things that happen around our lives, by the things that happen on Facebook, by drama that happens in our life and people talking and people saying things or people, you know, doing great things in life, good things and negative things, neutral things. We are marveled by what happens everywhere else. But these disciples had the creator of the universe. They had the redeemer of the world in their boat, and they did not marvel until this huge event happened. So let's go back to 18, and we're going to talk about, about what's going on here. 18 says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. It's talking about the Sea of Galilee. Now let me give you some context here. The Sea of Galilee is not really a sea. It's a lake. It's a pretty big lake, though. And um, this lake from north to south is 13 miles long, okay? 13 miles long from north to south. So Jesus is saying, all right, we need to go across this lake. So that's what he says. Now, 13 miles is a long way for a boat, long way. Even driving, it takes, you know, a while to get across that. Now, 19 says... All right, so he's ready to go. And a scribe, what is a scribe? Like, like a Pharisee, they know so much of the law, right? He comes up to Jesus, came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him in verse 20, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God, the Son of Man, has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus really opens up the reality of what it means to be a Christian here. He says, son of man, right now, right there, he's using a messianic title. He's pretty much saying he's God. He's pretty much saying, uh, you know, son of man, all the way in Daniel, when that word is used, son of man, he's pretty much saying, that's me, okay? But he's saying, all right, so you want to follow me? Right, this scribe is coming, man, he knows the law. This guy is a religious. This guy is holy. This guy, you know, he just knows everything about the scriptures. And he comes to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I want to get in that boat too. Let me join your crew. Let me become part of your disciples. I want to join you. And Jesus says, are you sure? Because foxes have holes. Animals have places to go. But even the Messiah, the Son of Man, has no place to lay his head. Now, this blows our mind because today we don't hear that message anymore. You don't hear a pastor coming to the church saying, who in here wants to be a Christian? Because if you do, you may be persecuted and you may have nothing. You may be homeless. You may go through a lot of persecution. You may go through a lot of trials. It will be uncomfortable. Who in here wants to be a Christian? Pastors usually don't preach that. Usually what they're preaching is, oh, brother, go to God and, and, and he will help you financially and he will give you what you need and he will give you comfort and you will have peace in your heart and you will have joy and you will have this and you will have that. And people are like, oh, I want that. That's what the scribe wanted. But Jesus is saying, are you sure you want to follow me? Because Christians have less privileges than animals. Because maybe you won't be homeless, but you're probably, if you're living the right life, if you're actually being my disciple, if you're actually following me, you probably won't have a place to lay your head. And that can mean different things for all of us. That can mean a lot of drama. 
That can mean a lot of people that go against what you're saying. A lot of people are unhappy with how you're living. How committed are you? We don't know what happened to the scribe, if he followed or not. But how committed are you to Jesus? Because living in this, in this world, in, in this country right now, it's so easy. I mean, we have the AC going on in here. We're all like, ah, oh, so comfortable, right? We have everything just in our fingertips. But then when it comes to Jesus saying, you know what? If it came down to choosing fame or choosing money or choosing wealth and comfort, and then the other decision is, well, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to lose a lot. So I'm going to lose friends, maybe family. I'm probably going to lose my job. I'm probably going to lose my home. Jesus is saying, you know what? It's very different when you begin to follow Jesus. But then someone else approached him, verse 21. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me go first bury my father. See, burying your father in that day was like a priority. See, the priest uh, of Israel he was not able to touch any dead person at all. It was unclean for him to do that. But the only time that he can actually touch a dead person was his own father. So it was a huge deal. If your own father passed away, even the priest was able to go and bury his own father. But this guy is like, hey, God, Jesus, can I bury my father first and then go follow you? And look at how Jesus responds. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. See, we don't know if this guy's father already died or not. Chances are he didn't die, and he's just stalling. So he's going to go back home, live with his dad, do his thing, you know, just honor his dad and wait till his dad passes away. And then, after he's outside of the authority of his dad, he's no longer alive, so now I can do whatever I want. Now I'm going to go and follow Jesus. And how many people have that mentality? You know what? I, I, I'll serve Jesus when it's comfortable for me. I'll serve Jesus a little later after I do my partying, after I go through college, after I do my drugs and alcohol, after I do my thing, because then, uh, okay, I'm, I'm old, I have a kid, now I can settle in and finally begin to follow Jesus. Many times we hear that all the time. They say, oh, Christianity, that's, that's an old person's religion. That's an old person's religion. But it's not. Jesus is saying, you know what? Follow me now, because your dad, there's many people who can bury him right now. See, but Jesus is not saying, oh, you shouldn't bury your father, you know, come follow me. But, but he's giving you a choice. He's saying, what is your priority? Is your priority what people are thinking, what people, what people care about? Like, oh, wow, you're not going to bury your own father? Wow, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that? Or is it, you know what? Jesus is first in my life. Jesus is priority. I don't care if I have to leave my family. I don't care if I have to not even go to my dad's funeral. If I have to decide whether to go to my dad's funeral, to do the things that people expect of me, and, and, or, or follow Jesus, I need to follow Jesus. See, we come to two different people here, two different people that want to follow Jesus. They have the right intentions, but their heart is not ready to follow Jesus. They're not sacrificing what needs to be sacrificed. The first guy is saying, I want to follow you, but Jesus is saying, you know what? It's harder than you think to to be a Christian. It's not comfortable at all. And then the other guy is like, oh, uh, 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 let me just give in to the pressure of the world real quick, and then I'll follow you. Let Let me just... Just figure this out first, and then I'll follow you. And Jesus is saying, you know what? No, it has to be now. Because your tomorrow is never guaranteed. Let me tell you guys something. We all have an expiration date here. Every one of us, someday, will die. But we don't know when. We don't know when. So, okay, you want to stall? You want to wait later to to worship me? To, you know, to just find out who I am? It may be too late. And I'm telling you guys right now, if you have never accepted Jesus into your heart, if you've never given your life to Jesus, how do you know that tomorrow you'll still be alive? 
Today is a day where you follow Jesus. Like, no more stalling. No more sin. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it means, you know what, I'm going to start letting things go because I know that it's not good for me. Because many times you try to fill this void and filling this void of things that are empty. It just makes us empty. And then he goes on. Verse 23. This is where we get to the story that I want to talk about. 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Okay, Jesus first got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Now I want to tell you a little backstory of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is 680 feet below sea level, and right next to it there's a mountain called Mount Hermon, and this mountain is 9,000 feet above sea level. So the difference between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee is tremendous, it's drastic. So because of this, people know that in the Sea of Galilee, there could be a lot of storms, a lot of turbulence, a lot of crazy things happening in the lake. People that go to visit the Sea of Galilee know that, hey, if I go out there on a boat, chances are there might be a storm. And this is the crazy thing about the Sea of Galilee. It could be a bright blue sky with no clouds at all, and out of nowhere, suddenly, there could be a storm in that sea. So the disciples that are fishermen, they know the sea. They follow Jesus. They step into the boat knowing that, wow, 13 miles is a long time. There could be a chance that there may be a storm coming out out of nowhere. See, Christians, when we decide to follow Jesus, we need to know, we need to count the cost. Jesus said that. We need to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. Because following Jesus can bring a lot of storms. You can stay on the bay and watch other people do their thing and be comfortable like, hey, I'm over here. Or you can step into the boat and realize there could be a storm out of nowhere. You know, I was telling telling people, you know, know, when I say, hey, how are you doing? Congratulations with your engagement and everything. Like, like I'm like, I'm doing so good right now. Like, you know, my life right now is so good. God is blessing me always and, and it's just so so much joy you know well, almost to the point where I'm like sooner or later this is gonna be a valley somewhere because it's too good to be true you know what I mean because I know that there's gonna be a storm that's the Christian life so these guys these disciples they followed him in verse 24 and behold there arose a great storm on the sea the NLT says suddenly there arose all right like out of nowhere there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. There's a great storm. These waves are literally going over the boat. And what is Jesus doing? Sleeping. Now what does that show us? It shows that Jesus is human. Right before that, he's doing ministry and helping and healing and and preaching and doing all these things. And he's tired, man. So tired that he can sleep on a boat that's rocking back and forth. For those of you who have experience with boats, I mean, if you go to like a ship, like a cruise ship, you hardly, you know, we went one time like many years ago and there was a storm and we can hardly feel it, right? You kind of feel like, like dizzy. You know it's moving, but not really. But step into a small boat, that thing will be rocking all right, people will just be like throwing up and feeling sick because, you know, like that thing is rocking. But Jesus is like, ah, this is, this is great. He's sleeping. But this shows that ministry is tiring. Ministry is something that drains you. And I'm not just talking about ministry as in being a pastor, being a, a, you know, a leader. It, 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 it's just being a Christian. Your life is ministry. And, and to the point where you say, okay, I'll do work for God as long as it's comfortable for me. As long as it works to my advantage. But the moment it's tiring, the moment, oh, we're weary, the moment, we, oh man, there's no sleep at all, the moment we're, we're, you know, we're depressed, the moment we're stressed, we're like, oh, I don't think God wants this. This is not what God wants for me because he wants me to be comfortable. 
And Jesus, he was sleeping on the boat because he was tired. He had compassion. I mean, read the Gospels. You'll, you'll read parts where he's hungry and he's trying to be alone with his disciples and to eat. And then he saw all these people and it says he had compassion on them like sheep without a shepherd. How do you view people around your life? Do you view them as another chore? Do you view them as people that you have to do this because I'm a Christian? Or do you view them with compassion? Saying, you know what, I, I need to help this person because probably no one else will. And I want to serve. I want to do everything I can. Even though I get only two hours of sleep, I don't care. I'm going to go and help and have compassion on these people. They could be annoying. They could be irritating. They could be really, really hard to deal with. But I want to do whatever it takes to love them. And that's what Jesus does for you every day. Every day. So he was sleeping, right? Verse 25. And they went and what did he do? They woke him up saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Now, all right, like I keep imagining this situation. Right, they're on a boat. I don't know how big it is. Probably fits about 12, so it's a pretty decent sized boat. They're on this boat, and what does it say about the waves? Read it. What does it say about the waves? What is it doing? Swamping. What's that? Right, it was, the boat was being covered with waves, right? So what's happening to the water? Where is it going? It's going into the boat. So what do you think? What would you do in that situation right away? Swim? Scream? Anyone else? What would you do if the water is getting into the boat? Padding, huh? Trying to, get it out. Trying to get it out. You're bailing out water, okay? But just picture these disciples getting bales of water. <laughs> you know, and, and they're just trying to live. They're just trying to survive, right? And they're doing all this where they're all sweating, and, and the wind is beating, and there's a storm, and, and they're all just all wet, and they can't even hear each other because of all the thunder, and they're just, oh, come on. All of a sudden, they look at Jesus, is, what is Jesus doing? <laughs> right? They're probably thinking, Hello, Jesus, we're dying here. How can you be sleeping? We need one more person. You're another man, all right? You're, you're beefy too, man, because you, you're a carpenter, man. You have muscles, all right? We need your muscles, Jesus. Come on, get up. We need your help. And many people, they look at that, and they see that, wow, these disciples have faith, right? They woke Jesus up because, oh, they believe in Jesus. They have dependence on Jesus. They have faith in Jesus. But really, they woke him up out of desperation, there's these lyrics that um, I want to read to you guys. It's by Christina Grimmie, and it's called, I Bet You Don't Curse God. Listen to these lyrics. I bet you don't curse God when the doctor calls with a stern voice and a test results, and he asks you to come in right away. I bet you don't curse God when you're on a plane in the turbulence, pouring rain, and you're hoping that you'll make it out okay. Everybody cries. We've all faked a smile when your back's against the wall and your hands are tied. There's pain, life hurts, there's a thousand things you think you don't deserve. All hope is lost when you spend it all and you just can't beat the odds. I bet you don't curse God. I bet you don't curse God. In verse 2, I bet you don't curse God when your child is gone and he ain't picking up the phone and it's 2 a.m. on a Saturday in July. I bet you don't curse God at your bottom line and your credit cards are all declined and you don't know where you're going to sleep tonight. Verse 3, I bet you don't curse God when you're dying in bed, about to take your one last breath, and you're holding on before you say goodnight. I bet you don't curse God. And I think that's what happened with the disciples. They didn't really believe in who Jesus was. But when the storm was big, out of desperation, they wake him up. Out of desperation, they wake him up. See, scientists, they can claim that there's no God they can claim all these different things and say, oh, science is better. You know, we've discovered this. But let me tell you, scientists don't know squat. Amen. Even the meteorology, they can't even determine when a rain is coming, when a storm is coming. They can be like, oh, Monday there's going to be a storm. We can go on Monday and there could be no storm. But Jesus, God, he is above the storm. 
God, he is above the weather. God, he is above everything that we know and live for. And these guys, these disciples, man, they're, they're used to the sea. They live for the sea. That's their job. And yet they're in a storm that they can't even handle. Let me tell you guys something. You're going to go through storms where you won't be able to handle it on your own. Because there are storms that we go through every day that we can, you know, we can just swipe with our credit card. We can just do our little thing to make it go away. But there will be storms where you will be knocked off your feet and you won't even know how to get back up. And then it shows how much faith do you have in a powerful God who is above your storm. Now, I love this. Verse 26, and he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. <laughs> I just look at this, and I, it's so funny, because they wake him up. There's a storm. They're bailing out water. And as soon as they wake Jesus up, does he get up first? Still? Lying down. All right? Jesus is... Right? What's the first thing he does? He rebukes the disciples during the storm. All right, can you imagine Jesus waking up? All right, he's waking up. Why are you afraid? You guys have little... Have I taught you nothing? All of these miracles that I have done, you still don't have faith. Look at me. Hey, everyone, look at me. Where is your faith? Right? And the disciples are like, <laughs> Where are you going? Where are you Why are you afraid? Answer me, guys. Where is your faith? Come on. And the storm is going, and oh, we're going to die. Jesus is trying to preach, and we don't want to hear the preaching. We don't want to hear the preaching. And the storm is going, and the disciples are saying, we need to bail out water, Jesus. Come on! You know what that shows about Jesus? He is more concerned about your heart than the storm that you're in. He's more concerned about your faith than the storm that's going all around you. See, he can be in your boat, and you can be in desperation, wanting to survive, and Jesus is right there saying, why are you afraid? Why don't you have faith? Do you know who I am? Do you know who's in your boat? See, many times, guys, we make the wrong prayers. We're praying, asking God, God, please stop the storm. Stop it. I don't want this storm anymore. It's too hard. It's too overwhelming. It's too overbearing. And Jesus is saying, why are you afraid? See, instead of asking God and praying for him to take away the storm, I think we should pray for it for us to stay in the storm so that we can learn what God is trying to teach us in the storm. Amen. See, these men... They wouldn't know who Jesus is unless they went through that storm. Because they've seen Jesus do all these miracles. They've seen what he's capable of doing. But once they hit the storm, that's when they really realize who Jesus is. What marvels you? Is it Facebook? Is it what people have to say about you? Is it what others say behind your back? Is it the good things happening? in other people's lives? What marvels you? What keeps you going? What do you spend time with? My question is, is Jesus marveling you? Is Jesus amazing you? So after that rebuke, it says, then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. In 27, and the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? So I think you can go. <clears throat> 27, and the men marveled. What man is this? See, 
in that time, the power of nature was a huge deal. We read in the Old Testament a lot about how God has power over nature. And it's huge for them. It's like, wow, like a God that has power over nature. And the disciples, they've been following Jesus. They've been hearing him preach. They've been seeing him do all these miracles. But then they really see what he's capable of doing. And they still say, what man is this? See, now this is what I want to tell you guys. Jesus has the power to stop a storm, but he also has the power to start a storm. We don't really know where the storm came from. It could have been the evil one. It could have been just natural currents. But I think that many times, Jesus does not still a storm because he wants to teach you something. Now, now let me tell you something. Many times, I mean, you know, I can look at this passage and apply it to our lives by saying, guys, you can conquer the storm. You can call on Jesus and he will help you through your storm. But I don't think that's the point of what Matthew was trying to say. I really don't think that Matthew was trying to point at us and saying, you can just pray to God. You can just wake him up. No, really, I think what Matthew is trying to show is Christological, meaning it's focused on who Christ is, not what he can do. Because, yeah, he can heal people. The disciples saw him heal leprosy. But once they see that he calmed the storm, that even the storm obeys him, oh, they have another thing coming. They know what he could do, but they did not know who he was because they look at him and say, what man is this? And maybe you're sitting here right now and you see what God has done. You've seen people come to church. You've seen people become saved, maybe even healed. But many of us are on this boat with Jesus sleeping. And we don't even know what Jesus is capable of doing. See, because these disciples, they had faith in Jesus, but see, they didn't know that Jesus is above everything, okay? Jesus is above sickness, okay? Jesus is above sin. See, Jesus is above death. Jesus, he is above all of our problems. Jesus is above our pills. Jesus is above our depression. He is above our stress. Jesus is above everything that happens in our life. And then they find out that Jesus is above very nature. He is above the storm. He is above the world. He is above the universe. He is outside of time and space. And guys, when we actually believe that, we too can sleep in a storm. Because the message is not about, oh, if you go into a storm and, and, and the water's coming in, all you got to do is sleep because God is going to save you. That's not the message here. The message is a lot more profound. The message is when the going gets tough and there is a storm happening around you, are you able to trust in God fully? Fully trust in him. And say, you know what, God, I don't care what happens. I don't care what goes on around me. I don't care if there's water filling up my boat and it seems like, oh, it's going to sink. When we understand who is in our boat, when we understand that in our boat is a God who loves us, a God who cares, a God who gives his life for us, when we believe in that, wholeheartedly we are able to sleep in that storm we are able to sleep in our crisis oh guys you 
If only you knew how much this message is preaching to me. How much I care about what others think. How much time I spend on Facebook wondering what people are doing. And me as a pastor, I should be reading more. I should be spending more time with God. I should be wholeheartedly pouring out my life to God. Guys, if this message isn't speaking to you, I don't know who it's speaking to. Because I read this and I saw that they were marveled by God. I want to be marveled by God. I want to be marveled by Jesus. I want to just sit in my boat just in awe and say, wow, God, you're amazing. I'm in the storm right now. And I know it's tough. My boat is filling up. But God, you're amazing. Wow, God. Look at what you've done. I want to sleep on this boat like you. I want to be able to trust you, God. Maybe that's here. You, maybe that's you right now. You're saying, you know what? I've been marveled by everything else in my life except God. I've been marveled by everything else except God. Right now, I want to pray. I want to pray. And while you just bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to just read this poem by Molly Annis, an Indiana housewife who loves the Lord. And she penned this poem called Housewives Lament. It says, I'm all wrapped up in my machines. I push a button, my clothes are clean. I push another and so are my jeans. How can I find Jesus? Where does it say on? It must have been easy for Peter and John, for they didn't have their TV turned on. So when you called them, they just got up and went. But what did they leave? Just their fishing net. I've worked so hard for all I own. Now you're trying to tell me it's only a loan? I would answer your call, Lord, and give up all I own if you could only reach me through my telephone. How can I find Jesus? Where does it say on? I follow you too, Lord, wherever you go. If I can just bring along my transistor radio, but please don't come during my TV show. How can I find Jesus? Where does it say on? If there's anyone here who is saying, you know what, I need to marvel at Jesus. I, I, I mean, I'm going to tell, I'm, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I want to leave Facebook for a little bit. And just see how much time I have left for spending time with God. Maybe you're in a spot. Maybe your issue is not Facebook. Maybe your issue is something else. But I want to pray for you. We're going to pray as a church. And if there's anyone here who, um, who wants that, I want you, you know, on the count of three, I want you just to get up here and just kneel down or stand up, whatever feels comfortable for you, and we're going to pray together. Or on the count of three, don't hesitate. Just come forward. We just want to pray for you. All right, we're going to make this thing real. We're going we're gonna to just call upon the Lord, all right? One, Jesus loves you. Two, he is here for you. Three, anyone, come up. Don't hesitate. Just come up. Who needs that prayer?